they've told everyone that the mass attracting mass is the causal mechanism for the motion of the bodies in the sky. So this is a quick history on that and how they how the math is mixed together. Because the big claim to fame is that when you apply Newton's equations to Kepler's law, what do you get? Proportional ratios for everything and it works out based on mass attracting mass. So we're going to see how that works and what it means. So uh, Kepler's first law is that all the orbits are ellipses. The second law is that based on where they're at in their orbit, uh, in relation to the sun, they'll either be moving faster or slower. So that's the perihelion and aphelion. So when they're uh, coming around the sun and moving back towards it. And then Kepler's third law is that the square of the orbital periods of the planets is directly proportional to the cube of the semi-major axis of their orbits. Now, what that means is when you take their periodicity, how long it takes for them to complete a revolution in the sky and get back to their starting location, you take that, you square it, and that's equal to the cube of what their orbit would be. And we'll get to how we get to what their orbit would be here in a second. So here we have Newton's equations for centripetal force, and it's equal to gravitation, right? So we have FCV equals mv squared over r and to put this into terms that can be applied to the sky with kepler's laws we need to reduce things down and break it apart a little bit do some refactoring here so we turn this velocity we turn this v squared into four pi r and that's going to turn that into a radius of how fast things are moving in the sky essentially and then the m here is going to actually cancel out in the equation so this isn't relevant at all and then we're just going to have these two constants essentially and it's going to be about these two constants over that proportionality constant for the radius of their orbit and then that's going to give them the t squared which is going to be proportional to the cube of their orbit so this is how they came up with, oh, the Earth must be X, Y, Z distance away, right? So let's take it back a second to Cavendish, where we can establish our constants. So Cavendish does his experiment with lead balls, and he gets these constants. Now, with these constants, they can start applying things to, like periodicity to the sky. So they say that you watch the sun complete its uh, revolution, right, your course of a year. You apply that periodicity to these equations, and you get a orbital di orbital diameter of 93, or not diameter, you get the 93 million miles on the semi-major axis, right? So it tells you how far away it is based off of that. And then they just applied this, the same thing to everything else. So once they had it with the sun, because it's algebra, right? You can reverse what the mass of the sun would be, and you could take your big M, you could take your big M here and apply it to the sun, and then you use use gravity there, and then you apply it to the periodicity of the movement of any planet, right? So Mars, Venus, Jupiter, and it's going to output proportional distances for everything. So that's why everything lines up like this. This is how they got their scale for everything. This is how it was all derived. It's purely based off of observation. There's no experiment or anything like that. It's all ratios and, and constants. No 30 kilometer velocity has ever been measured to substantiate the connection between Kepler's laws and Newtonian dynamics. This is why all the physics had to be redefined after Michelson-Morley, because it had well been established that they could use the concept of absolute space to measure velocity and using, this, using the speed of light as the measuring stick for that. And let's see here. So to further end on some kinematics, so they extended the role play with Einstein, right, with relativity. Now, when you apply Einstein's equations to the concept of the gravitational field, we're talking this big G here, we're, and then it's being converted into a gravitational field, et cetera, right? So the mathematical predictions for that, for gravitational lensing, are purely kinematical based on ratios as well, because it's the same exact thing. And what Edward Dowdy Jr. does is instead of using the sun as the mass and producing a mass attracting mass gravitational field, he treats the R as a Gaussian surface. And what a Gaussian surface does is it would convert this M and this G into uh, charge potential in electric flux and equidistantly um, distribute that radially outwards, right? So it's giving you an electric field gradient that extends out instead of the gravitational field. So any observation made where they're like, oh, this is exclusive to gravitation or relativity theory because X, Y, Z, if that observation does exist, it's the causal mechanism is completely unsubstantiated because it's just the constants. You could replace nothing from the relativity theory and just change the story about what you conceptualize the R value as or, or how that associates to what you think the thing in the sky is. If you think it's a plasma or if you think it's a gaseous giant, the only, it's just the size of the R is what matters. The story about the R is irrelevant. So 
that's how they do sky calculations for everything. It's based off of proportional ratios. And then when the ratios match for their model that it's not mutually exclusive for, they just tout it as if it's mutually exclusive and irrefutable evidence that Newton and Einstein and all these people are kings. Wait, are you saying that the math doesn't make the Earth move? Precisely. The math is not the causal mechanism of Earth's motion. <laughs> <laughs> now, they did come up with a cool story to describe it all, right? And then to even back up the Kepler story, they're like, oh, we just couldn't figure out these orbits for this, for Mars or whatever. And that whole story with Kepler, they try to give it mutual exclusivity just through storytelling. None of this is real. It's all ratios. It's just based off of how fast things move in the sky. It has nothing to do with their physical makeup their, or anything. That's the important part to know here. These lights in the sky are here for us, and you can interpret them however you want. They've just put a monopoly on it, right? Like, you have to conceptualize these as it has to have this much mass. It has to be a physical body. That's how they've gotten everyone, and it's all related to this math that has no physical meaning to reality because when they went to test it, they get nothing. No... 30 kilometers a second is mandatory for their model, right? If the Earth isn't in motion, then none of this math means anything. That's why they all freaked out in 1887. Boom, bro. And just so you guys know, it's it, this whole idea that Newton was a genius, figured out that gravity was a force because an apple fell, and then he figured out that's the force that makes everything move around. Actually, all he did was take the ratio of how the lights in the sky move in relation to each other, took that kinematic relationship, and then moved a couple variables around, swapped them out, and threw mass in there. And then people think that it's like it proved gravity's true or something. And he's pointing out that's not the case at all, right? Like this ratio was already known. It could be known by just looking at the sky. The fact that someone just plugged him in there and basically claimed it's like the cause of everything doesn't mean that it's true. And further, that when it was tested, it was directly falsified. It can't be true. And uh, yeah, that's pretty fascinating and what's even more fascinating right? you, you can use a magnetic force for all this another side note when you said and they act like it has to be these masses and all this stuff because really they just picked the ratios how did they start that they said oh let's look at this light that we call venus and let's pretend that it's the same size as the earth that we pretend we know the size of so they have their globe model, they think they have the known size of the Earth, and then they assumed that the light in the sky called Venus was the same size as it, and then they extrapolated all those ratios he was just talking about out to get the other sizes and then masses. And the funniest part, though, is that it didn't work. And now, even today, they're just still trying to perfect it. Like they, When they look at it and they come up with all these pseudoscience ideas of, this is how we'll know how much mass it is, the observations don't typically match what they attribute to being visible mass don't actually match what they claim the mass is. So long story short, the way that they got the mass that he's pointing out was just like this pl plug and play <laughs> fiction is just by assuming that Venus was the same size as, as their model of the earth. And then they claim that later. So once you have the size of Venus, you can extrapolate the size of all the other bodies based on the ratio within this idea. And then they claim that later on, they just verified that luckily they were correct and Venus is basically the same size as the Earth and they were right about everything. Sometimes you just get lucky by looking up at the light in the sky that's the size of uh, maybe a dime or no, probably not even that. And then just going, you know what? Where's that? <laughs> How insane is it? That's one of the craziest parts of this whole story for me is that they looked up at the, the light in the sky called Venus and they said... I bet that's the same size as the earth. And then they claim they just got it right. <laughs> yeah. Dude, the gall, dude. To not even be like, oh, but we were way off. You're to sweep it under the rug. They're like, no, but we were right, bro. They can't help themselves. And that's what I like about the heliocentric model. It's that stupid. Yeah. Yeah. They yeah. Like to have a lot of fun with it. What's crazy is it's also because if they weren't right about it, right, what do they have to do? They have to go back and scrap all this math the magic that they had pieced together. Dude, imagine telling people that these equations hold true with this philosophy for a couple of centuries, and then you roll around, you don't, me not only do you not measure it, but you sweep that under the rug by redefining how light works and all that and, and, and how you can measure motion. 
And then some guy puts his telescope to the sky and sees galaxies spinning too fast. And you're like, oh, dude, now we have to have a new thing. And that's what do we do? How do we supplement the missing mass to explain the failure of this equation applied to the sky? How do we supplement that? We fix it with dark matter. We just throw a little dark matter in there. How much matter does dark matter offset the, how much they're off by? Nine, is it 97% or 96.9995%? I can't remember and I want to be accurate. I know it's important. Just to, just, okay, let's right. just, let's clarify that. So dark matter and dark energy combined make up 96% of the universe. Mm. And then dark matter supposedly makes up 83% of all the matter in the universe. So supposedly 83% of all mass in the universe is dark matter. Yeah. So, which is pretty terrible. And this all started with, oh, these galaxies are 99% off. All right, there's only 1% of the matter we need, so it's pretty rough out there. Yeah, and they've always known. So here we're looking at Aries failure, right? We have a little tele we have a little lad with a telescope filled with water. And this starlight displacement is supposed to be moved such that he's going to have to correct his telescope to get it in there. And you know what he found, lads? Nothing. Didn't have to, barely had to correct it by 0 0.0 arc seconds. Or 0 0.8 arc, yeah, point zero, point zero 0.08 arc seconds, right? Almost nothing. And the prediction for the heliocentric model, right, for these to have physical meaning was that the, they were going to have to tilt the telescope by 15 arc seconds. Yikes. And then later in the year, they would have to tilt it 15 going in the opposite direction. So a total of 30 arc seconds over the course of the year to substantiate this velocity, to substantiate this model, this philosophy. And they got nothing, brother, nothing. And the only way that they could explain it is they said, okay, we're just never going to talk about this really. Because the only explanations on the table were at the time, right? They thought light may be a particle. And now people still think that, right? They're like, oh, the old quantized light. For the quantized light lads, when light enters this telescope and it's filled with water, the quantized particles would have to gain acceleration somehow so that there would be no correction required. So we all know that's not happening. Wait, let's, let's pause right there. Option. Let's pause right there. Because yeah, we know that's not happening, but let's clarify why. Because it would violate the law of conservation of energy and momentum. Okay, like the little quantized light particle can't enter the new medium and then maintain its speed without additional energy being introduced, as there was not additional energy introduced, of course, then it couldn't have sped up without it or it would violate the law of conservation of energy. So that's not even on the table as possible. Okay, sorry, go ahead. No, thank you. That, yeah, that's very important to, to include in there. And then the other way that you could interpret it, if you're a wave lad, shout out to the wave lads, is and if, you're, if you wanted to maintain heliocentrism, if you want to keep this velocity, you would have to say that the telescope, that there's ether inside the telescope, and it's carrying the light in the opposite direction of motion. So the Earth's moving this way, the correction angle should be this way. For some reason, there's ether in here, and it's going this way to, 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 to cancel it out. Those are the only options, right? And this was interpreted at the time when they had a stationary ether framework. So get how ridiculous this is, right? They were all using the ratio against the speed of light. So they were all invoking a stationary ether frame. So they said, okay, there's ether inside of the telescope, though. And that ether is bouncing around back and forth it's so that it can carry the light in the opposite direction. So even if you conceptualize the stationary ether, you have to make exception for what's going on in here. Special case to explain this as a heliocentrist. And of course, MMX throws stationary ether out the window, right? Yep. Yep. So this is a major conundrum, and that's why they just called it a failure, and people just now just say he was trying to prove ether and couldn't. That's not what happened. So can you guys formulate some actual intelligent response? Because we're pretty sure that you cannot. One does not exist within your confinement of pseudophysics.